Yeah, welcome to numerical methods for mathematical finance. And before we start with numerical methods, actually we will start with a quite different uh, chapter. You know, in, in the first sessions, we will start on computer arithmetics. I would like to you know, tell you a little bit about the lecture and give you maybe some motivation. So the aim of the lecture is, of course, to teach you numerical methods. Actually, the title is uh, Numerical Methods for Financial Mathematics or Computational Finance. Yeah, so there are here numerical methods and there is in the background an application. So our application is financial mathematics. But the methods that I will discuss in this lecture, well, they are quite general. Yeah, and you can use them in many different fields. Yeah, For example, the Monte Carlo method, a simulation method, you can use them in many different fields. So the focus is to bring you the numerical method and the application is giving you a little bit more intuition and you see how you can then uh, yeah, apply the method. A second part of the lecture is that I also like to discuss the implementation. And with respect to um, implementation, well, I like to emphasize on a clean, efficient, and extensible into implementation. So the idea here is that I do not illustrate the numerical method with some dirty code, with some dirty prototype. We, would, we also like to think a little bit about the design uh, what could be future extensions? Uh, how can we create a clean and um, efficient implementation? So with respect to these things, yeah, application, numerical method, implementation, or also the theory that is behind this, actually, they are all connected. And there is a value in combining these skills. Yeah? For example, I'm a mathematician and I work also in a group of mathematicians that develop in the sense of mathematical model developing, so modeling, and develop in the sense of implement. Yeah? Um, these models, these numerical methods yeah, in the industry. So, you have to understand the theory yeah, to have some better understanding of what you are actually doing. So all these things are connected. Yeah? So there's the theory, for example, the theory of stochastic differential equations. Yeah? And behind this, there is an application, for example, a stochastic differential equation modeling assets on the financial market. And then you like to have a numerical methods that simulates this stochastic differential equation. So it is a little bit that the theory and application yeah, provides you the intuition of what the numerical method is actually doing, but also going back, the numerical method provides you some intuition on the yeah, mathematical abstract objects. Yeah? So sometimes I like to think a little bit more in the implementation, yeah. so which variable depends on what quantity, yeah? uh, to remind me, okay, so how, how is actually the theoretical object um, described? So, but as I mentioned, the numerical method, okay, this is also the theory of the numerical method. It needs to be implemented. So we will look on how to have a clean implementation in the computer using state-of-the-art software development tools, yeah, hopefully. So to create a good implementation design, of course, you need to know the numerical methods, but it's also helpful to understand the theory and the application. Yeah? Because if you do understand the theory and the application, then this gives you maybe uh, some ideas of how to cut different parts yeah, of your program into different you know, modules, different classes. For example, because you know that you like to interchange something you know, in the near future, because there is another application that uh, requires this. So now we have this implementation of our numerical method yeah, 
simulating, for example, a stochastic differential equation. And then we can do numerical experiments with that. So the nice thing is that if we can do all this, yeah, as a single person, we can create for us a laboratory where we can conduct numerical experiments on these theoretical objects. So we have a laboratory and this laboratory provides us with new insights, say for the theory, but actually also for the numerical methods. Yeah, so we have new insights here for the theory and we also get some maybe new insights on the numerical method, we can analyze how it performs and so on. So all these things are connected. And of course, the core of the lecture is that we will discuss the numerical method, but we will also then discuss later the implementation design. And we always have applications uh, from mathematical finance to illustrate how the method works. And then I also try to conduct some numerical experiments with you. Okay, so summary aim of the lecture, we will discuss the selection of numerical methods. They have a high relevance in, yeah, in applications. So Monte Carlo method, for example, uh, we will discuss the theory, the theory then of the numerical method. That means, for example, convergence result. We will also discuss uh, the underlying algorithm and then the implementation of that algorithm. Our application is mathematical finance, yeah, but that's just an example. You can apply this in other fields. And I also like to use, as far as time permits, state-of-the-art software development tools. So we will use an IDE, for example, Eclipse. We will use a little bit revision control systems like Git, yeah, distributed version control systems and build management tools like Maven. And a last aspect, yeah, I also like to highlight is the aim of the lecture is that you should have some fun, some also some fun with coding, yeah, because seeing how this numerical methods works on the computer, yeah, is really a bit rewarding, yeah, because it's not just the theory. So you learn something then in the end about the models. Let me start with a motivation from mathematical finance, where you can see that already in one application, namely here the risk neutral valuation of a financial derivative. If you like to do that numerically, there are a lot of numerical methods in this problem. Yeah? Actually, our first three or four chapters yeah, uh, are already related to this problem. So um, maybe you know this. Yeah? So there is the universal pricing theorem that allows you to uh, evaluate a financial derivative. So what I have here is a model. So this here is Black Schultz model for a stock. So there is a stochastic differential equation describing the movement of the stock. So this stochastic differential equation, if you like to simulate the sample path, yeah, if you do not understand these words, sample path whatsoever, we will understand them because we will implement the numerical methods. So this looks a little bit like that. So I also can run this in code, yeah, generating this picture. Yeah, these are all the experiments that we will do later, for example, there is here a very small code using the stuff that we will create during this lecture. And if you run that code, you will produce this simulation, these sample paths of this model. Okay, so there is in this model, a model for the stock. And there is also a maybe more simple model for a second asset on my financial market, the bank account. Okay, so this is not a stochastic differential equation. This is just an ODE, an ordinary differential equation. And yeah, you maybe know that the solution of this guy here is initial value 
exponential RT. Yeah, so it's just this function that we have here already plotted below. Okay, so there's some exponential growth. Yeah, so here the R is 5%, so the growth is not so strong. Um, actually, you see that you have this exponential growth also in your model for the stock, which means that you have some kind of drift in the model of the stock that goes similar to what you see, what you see on the right. So there is a, a drift and the guy that is creating the randomness is this guy here. So this guy is the Brownian increment in the stochastic differential equation. So W is a Brownian motion. So now my problem is I would like to value a financial derivative. Yeah. So value a financial derivative means that I know there is some payoff, some payment that depends on, say, a future value of my stock, for example, at this time. And I would like to have a fair value of this. And there is the uh, universal pricing theorem, yeah? the universal valuation theorem that tells me how we do that. Okay, so risk neutral valuation can be expressed under certain assumption, okay, uh, as an expectation of that future payoff. So consider, for example, now a financial derivative that pays in time capital T, this function V of T, where your yeah, random variable S, okay, is now just S observed at some future time. Yeah, so maybe we have here time T equals three. Yeah, so that is my random variable S of T. Yeah, so all these sample paths then you know you can express the value of this financial derivative as an expectation well expectation of this value at the future point in time yeah so here this v divided by the bank account at payment time multiplied with the bank account at evaluation time so that's the maria so i need to calculate the expectation yeah so how do you do this if you need to do it numerically okay so here for the black shorts model so for that model here, you can, for say simple payoffs like the European option, for that guy here, you can derive an analytic formula. So you do not need a numerical method. But if you like to do it numerically, these are, for example, the step that we have to do. So first thing is we need to approximate the expectation of a random variable. Okay, so there is the random variable x here, which is actually a function of the random variable s of t, no? s of t, the stock at time capital t, and we need to approximate the expectation of a random variable. That is already a numerical method. It's for example, the Monte Carlo method that we can use here. That will be a big section of our lecture. Okay, but now um, actually you have this model. The model is a stochastic differential equation. So you have the Black Scholes model. You have for the model the initial value of these quantities and the drift R and sigma, the volatility, but how does this describe this random variable? So you need to generate S of capital T out of these parameters. So how does S of capital T depend on these parameters? So you have this model here with the stochastic differential equation. And what you can do is you can replace the infinitesimal increments by a finite difference. So I just replace now the D with a delta and my model now reads in discrete form that the change of S is equal to R 
s times the change of time plus sigma s times the change of w. And if you now you know, use time discretization, so here I have a time discretization, then you can derive from that a numerical scheme that tells you the new value of S, yeah, so at the next time step is the value of S at the previous time step plus yeah, the drift and the diffusion part. So how to create the random variables or approximations of the random variables from the model, from the stochastic differential equation, this is another part of our lecture. That is time discretization of stochastic differential equations. Okay, but now I have a scheme that creates the next random variable out of the previous random variable. And the guy that is introducing the randomness, I already mentioned that, is here our Brownian motion. So the Brownian increment is generating the randomness. We know that this Brownian increment, yeah, by definition, more or less, is normal distributed yeah, with mean zero and standard deviation square root of time step size. How do you sample a normal distributed random variable? So that's the next task that is hidden here. Yeah? In order to approximate the expectation, we need to generate the random variables, but the gender, uh, generating the random variables requires that we sample distributions. So we need to generate drawings. So that means random numbers in that, in our case here, of a multivariate normal distributed random variable, because we need this for each time step. Yeah, So this is a random vector we are actually sampling, because each time step is an independent increment. So that's another part of the lecture we need to discuss how we do in the computer generate these random numbers. OK, so I already have three parts. I have a fourth one here on this little section on the motivation, because if we go back, you see, I have this theorem that tells me that the value of the financial derivative can be expressed as an expectation. But what is actually behind this? Because this is a bit strange. I mean, if this here is an ex expectation and this here is a linear function of this S, then it means actually that the variance doesn't even play a role. Yeah, The expectation of S of capital T you know, so is, is not does not depend on the variance of the random variable. So that appears a bit uh, strange. Why does the variance not enter? And maybe you notice the reason that is behind this is that you prove this theorem by well, having some assumptions. You have the ability to perform replication. Yeah? So behind this, there is the assumption that we can perform replication. That means there is a trading strategy, a self-financing trading strategy. So self-financing means you just reshuffle your portfolio. Yeah, You never put money back again, uh, money um, uh, into the portfolio again. So you just reshuffle the, the portfolio. And there is such a trading strategy that 100% replicates yeah, under certain assumptions, so without frictions, this financial derivative. So this strategy removes the risk, yeah, therefore risk neutral valuation. And um, it allows us to replicate the derivative, given that we have initially set up the portfolio in the correct way. That means we have to buy a portfolio that actually exactly corresponds to this, to this value. So this value here is the cost to set up a replication portfolio. So if you remember this application, you have another thing here that is hedging. So behind the universal pricing theory, so behind this guy from our previous slide, there lies the ability to perform replication, so you can find a self-financing replication portfolio, P, 
that has the property that it is replicating your financial derivative. And this P consists of units of your bank account and units of your stock. So the trader in the bank is actually just performing this strategy. So the trader in the bank has to know how many stocks he has to buy. So the question is, how do we get the number of stocks to perform the replication strategy? If you look into the proof, yeah, you see this is proven by the Martingale representation theorem. Yeah, So you can write V or V divided by N is a Martingale. Then you have the Martingale representation theorem. And then actually these guys here are the coefficients that pop out of this theorem. And if you now apply Ito's lemma and compare the left side to the right side, you immediately get that the phi is just the partial derivative of the value that you calculated with that expectation with respect to the initial value uh, or the value that you observe at the given time. So there is um, another numerical method here. So we are interested in calculating or approximating partial derivatives uh, with the computer. And actually, yeah, you just think this is finite difference, but this is not trivial if the quantity is calculated by a numerical method, like for example, a Monte Carlo approximation. Yeah? So numerically calculating partial derivatives of Monte Carlo approximation is not so trivial. So that was a small tour where you have in a very compact application, yeah, valuation and hatching of financial derivatives already for yeah, very different numerical methods that I'd like to cover with you here.